It's another week of the Johnny and Gene Show. Hello, everybody, and uh, this is my co-host, Gene. What's going on, everybody? And this is Kenji Gallo. Hey, Kenji. Hey. How's everything? Everything's good, man. Everything's good. <laughs> so uh, tell the people out there exactly who you are and what you are involved with for the people that don't know you. Okay. Um, my name is Kenji Gallo. I... Uh, was uh, with the LA family first uh, from the early, the late eighties until the nineties. And then I moved to Brooklyn, New York, and that was with the Columbos, specifically Teddy Persico Jr., his crew. Uh, I flipped and I wore a wire against them. I ended up putting him away, which caused them to get Steve Marcus and bring down Eddie Garofolo and Eddie's uncle, Manny, and got Michael uh, Persico and the rest of them. I was uh, just a bad dude, man. I was involved in uh, large, large uh, cocaine trafficking, uh, transportation, and pornography. I specialized in uh, the porn world and Porn Valley. I worked with a lot of guys from New York and uh, a lot of Gambinos, a lot of Bananos and Columbos in the porn industry. So that's pretty much where I'm at now. I'm not no longer like that. I have, you know, I run a gym. Kenji, how did, uh, Kenji, uh, I want to cut you off. How did you meet Teddy first ago? Um, well, first, what happened is I was with, uh, I I was with the LA family, and I and I was coming to New York all the time. I met a bunch of Colombo guys, like younger guys, and like Eddie Garofolo and all them, and I was hanging out. And um, I used to come to Brooklyn, and I would stay in Seagate and in, in by Bay Ridge, you know, like by the um, uh, Coney Island. And then I would uh, I would just stay there and like stay there a couple weeks, come here, like commit crime. They're doing the pump and dump and everything. So I met all those guys like Craig Marino and and John Bonanza and all of them. And then uh, I just they Eddie and them asked me if I wanted to move to uh, Brooklyn. And so I said, yeah. But then my my captain, my my street boss, Jimmy Kachi, who I was with in L.A., was in prison. And so uh, he knew he he knew Carmen. And so they got. They 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 got word to to Carmine and then he got I got permission to move and then I moved and then I was in Teddy's crew but Teddy wasn't there so I just I would just kick up money to those guys and they would give money to Teddy and then all of a sudden they changed the Rockefeller law and Teddy got out right yeah he was supposed to be in for like another five or six years and um, then everything changed like I I remember the day I was like in uh, I was in Bay Ridge and we were over at uh, at 101 and then Danny Persico and uh, Sean uh, Persico, they, they told me and Eddie that we had, they had to come talk to us, but not to talk in there. We went to La Yoon, the Chinese restaurant across the street. And then they told me that Teddy's getting out the next morning and not to tell anybody. What and year then, was that, Kenj? What year about? I believe it was like 2004, 2005, like right there in that area. And you, and you came around Brooklyn originally what year? Um, I started coming in the, in the late nineties. So like, so right. Yeah. Just, just when the war was ending, like right around that. And mm-hmm. so like, you know, like, uh, like my friends were doing stuff with like Joe Campy and then he got pissed because they messed it up and then he wanted to like kill us, you know? So it was like in that same time period when he was still out and, and those people Wait, were around. It, was this before the wild bill murder or after wild bill was killed? Wild bill was gone. Okay. Yeah. Right. I'm pretty sure he was gone. Right, so, or he or, or he was just gone when I got there. You know okay. what I mean? Like he had just right. disappeared. Right. So because but Billy Billy was still on the street then and and uh I think he was still there for a short period. But I mean he was Bill was definitely gone within by the time I moved there, he was for sure gone. So were you, were you hit with a Rico case? Who, me? Yeah. Um I got hit with Rico in, in uh in Vegas. I got hit with another uh, racketeering case in California and then conspiracy cases to distribute cocaine. But the 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 Rico case in Las Vegas was Operation Thin Crest and Operation Double Down is when they 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 got everyone all across the country. So oh. that was like when, you know, all they hit the Gambinos, they had everyone at the same time. And they because they weren't they were everyone. We were all trying to like we were trying to build up the L.A. family more and move. Right. We were in Vegas and everything else. And then they claimed that 
that uh, these guys murdered uh, this guy, that Herbie Blitzstein, who's from the outfit and was in the casino and like those issues. But the L.A. guys really didn't do that. It was it was other guys that were on the fringes. And, you know, well, we all got the blame for it. So did you get hit with anything personally with any violence, uh, killings, attempted yeah, well, murder I mean, or anything? Yeah, I've been arrested for attempted murder probably three, three times. Assault with a deadly weapon, assault with a assault and battery four or five times. Murder, I've been arrested for uh, attempted murder a couple of times, a kidnapping and extortion. So, okay. and uh, so now once you came into Brooklyn, obviously you're meeting the guys, and Teddy comes home. When did you first meet Teddy? Um, like I said, I, I, I met the, the night before that he was coming home. They gave me, uh, they gave me a bag with uh, a pair of like a white track suit, a pr pair of brand new white sneakers and a, and a, uh, a Cartier watch and a thousand dollars. And they wanted me to arrange a girl, a porn star to go with, to get in the limo and come back with them from upstate New York. Oh, really? The fr when you first meet him, that's your first encounter. Yeah. I only had talked to him on the phone. And like I'd and I'd send I had sent him pictures like he wanted pictures of course of porn stars and girls you know what I mean so I sent him pictures and I only talked to him on the phone from Big R Trucking with Eddie and everything else because he's been he was in prison for 17 years right 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 so so then Danny and and those guys uh, stayed with me and then we stayed at Layune till I don't know 11 o'clock at night and then then Eddie drove me home and then stayed with me at home until maybe like one o'clock. And then as soon as he left, I, I, I hit up the FBI, I text the guy and I, I, they told me to jog down the street and there'd be a car. And so I, I brought the phone with me that I was supposed to give to Teddy and I threw it in the car. And then they, they called me back in like an hour later and they said, go to this bagel shop, which was open. It was in Bay Ridge. And then uh, I went to the bagel shop and then I got bagels and this guy gave me a bag and inside was the phone. So they had already fixed the phone by then, whatever they did to it. You know what I mean? Whatever and, they needed. And, and the phone was for Teddy. Teddy was using yeah. the phone. Why, yeah, the, the do phone you know why he would use your phone? Why wouldn't he get his own phone? Did you? No, that was, that was his phone. They, they gave him, they had a phone in the bag. Oh, okay. All yeah, right, so they, they, they had this bag that they gave me, had, had his, this track suit, his shoes, a Cartier watch, $1,000 yeah. in cash in it. And then... Oh. So, so I got the girl in the limo and when Teddy got out of prison, he wanted to put up this, get, get a, a plane to fly across over the prison yard with a big sign on it. And so he spent all his money, the thousand dollars that he had, you know, on that. And then, then he, then he, then he was with the lim the girl in the limo in the back. And then he had some problems. Which, yeah, what kind of problems? Well, which I call, which I call the do over. So I, in my book, I put it in, in my book, Break Shot, which, is, which was my FBI code name. I called it The Do-Over. It's a Teddy well, Persky. What's the name of your book? I'm sorry. I, the name of my book is Break Shot. It's, break it's Shot? Break Shot. Yeah, here it is. It's all okay. all one word. Put it know. up a little higher so we can see it. There okay. you go. Right. So, And so it's it's called Break Shot. And that was my code name with the FBI. That's what they gave me. That was what they called me. And so in it, I have a whole chapter devoted to this, to this limo ride home with Teddy. Teddy, I'm supposed to keep Teddy out of trouble because they told me like that he was going to be street boss. He's not supposed to get into any trouble. And I got to like, you know, so anyway, he, first of all, thing he does is stop. Then he has a problem with the girl and he can't get it, can't get it up. He's like yeah. having, He's having, he's real, he's real frustrated. You know, he, he's been, he's been locked down. He's been drinking, he's drinking some champagne. And then we had to go to, we had to go to the city because he's, he's having like, he's already breaking parole. I mean, this is like, we're not even at, he's not even out of prison four hours. And they're yeah. having a meeting with all the Colombo guys in the city at this Italian restaurant. But before we, when we get there, Teddy wants to get some shoes. He, he doesn't like the shoes that they gave him. He wants right. to get some, some dress shoes, but he wants pointy to pointy toe dress shoes. Well, there's no, there's no pointy toe dress shoes. You know, they quit making them in the eighties. You know? yeah, yeah. So he's like in Bruno Mali and he's like looking for, looking for shoes. And then he pulls me aside and he's like, listen, listen, he goes, I got to get a do over, man. You got to set this up for me. You got to have a do over. And so then Danny, uh, another another older Colombo guy and Eddie pulled me aside and they're like, dude, look, you can't tell anyone about this. 
this is gonna this gotta stay here, man. Or you're gonna be telling everybody now. (laughs) Well, you're gonna be able to tell you something. You're gonna be up the jackpot. Yeah, so on on Teddy's behalf. uh, Yeah, I mean, how much time have you done? Me off and on installment plan like three and a half, four years. You know, okay. Not yeah. So when someone does a lot of time and on Teddy's behalf, and people that don't know that we're in a prison, coming home. is stressful, especially when you don't know if you're going to get hit with another case. And then he's drinking on top of that. So as much as it's funny, it's probably happened to all of us. So, you know, uh, you know, so I got to tell you the truth. People that don't know, they'll say, oh, what's wrong with the guy? Because it it really isn't like that. When you come home, he's probably full of anxiety, stress. You know, he's trying to get, you know, have sex so bad because he just came home, beautiful girl. But at the same time, he's got to have all kinds of anxiety going on. And anxiety and stress, you know, stop shift, you know, anything, obviously, people that don't know uh, would cause uh, you to have a limp dick, you know, so, uh, you know, but it's embarrassing. I mean, I I guess for anybody, it's happened to all of us. Ken, the next question, you, you, um, I had known someone that might know you, You there was a nickname you gave him, I think, that they were saying you were calling him or something like that. Uh, I had heard it. It's called the impotent Don or something like that you were calling him or something like that. Is that you? I didn't call him that. Some other people. I just call, I uh-huh. called him. I just called him the do over. That's a, that was oh, my code right. name. For okay. Well, someone called me. So like, yeah. <laughs> I used to be like, hey, it's the do over called me like to the FBI or somebody when I didn't want to say like his name to somebody. I mean, oh. look, in all honesty, this is the deal. Like, I I feel for him. I mean, it's a girl. He doesn't know her. He's in a limo. Like you said, he's coming home. There's a lot of stress. Guys are going to meet him. It's been a while. I feel bad for him. I and honestly. Out of every all the guys that I met, I like Teddy the best. And believe it or not, I actually did. That's the. He didn't that's have, the well, I'm gonna tell you something because he dated some girls that I used to date. He didn't have trouble yeah. getting women. So you know, on that on that, on that end of uh, Teddy, and I don't know him personally, but I know uh, mutual friends and the girls I've dated that dated him and back and forth. So uh, it's a funny story. I mean, obviously for any of us, if I was him, I'd just laugh about it, and you know. Yeah. I'm, be laughing about the part that you had him set up with a wire, but you know the part of uh, the sex thing. I mean, you know, it's funny, hey, but hey, yeah. uh, hey, Kenji, what's your uh, what's your opinion about him? Like, what kind of man was he when you met him? Like, what, what was his uh, what'd you think of him? Was he tough? Was it what was his whole demeanor? What would you think of him? I, I like I said, I really like Teddy, and like a lot of the dudes in Bay Ridge, and and you know, them are all posers. You know what I mean? They, you know, they're like second generation, like they're they're Italian, and they think like, oh man, I'm the toughest dude around, and they just like they they like talk down to other people. But Teddy, man, he was he he was a likable guy. He's a tough dude, and one of the one of the things he did, he took me aside right away, and he's like, man, I'm out. I got to make a statement. I got to leave a body in the street. I got to take care of some shit. We got some shit to do, and yeah. and like. Like, I felt bad because, like, he's telling me I'm wearing a wire, too. You know what I mean? It's not like he's not – his phone's wired up. I'm wearing a wire. But I actually – I like him, like, on a person-to-person basis more than I liked more most of the other guys. Like, a lot of the guys I, I, I didn't really like in Bay Ridge, and I got I, I got sick of them. I mean, you meet that in every, every group anyway, but it's just that the way they acted, it's like, like dude, oh, I'm the toughest, and I'm this and that. Bro, you haven't even been anywhere. You haven't even left Brooklyn. <laughs> you go from Brooklyn to Florida. You know, I'm like I'm a world traveler, dude. I've been to Mexico, Colombia, all over South America, everywhere. Like I've been to some heavy places, and like I'm listening to these guys. Bro, Brooklyn is bad, but it's not even close to like, well, like yeah, yeah. South you're, Central LA, man. You got to go down that, or you go to Colombia. I was in Colombia in the '80s, man, when they're blowing shit up every day. Right. Yeah, actually, uh, when I was in Colombia in Batakia, when I went on a run, and this is not. Back in the you know the 80s and 90s, this is 2003. About uh, they machine gunned a car in, in front of my house where I lived. I lived in a cartel's building. He owned it, so it was it was pretty secure. Anyway, I woke up and I heard uh, it had to be a hundred rounds. So I, I got up at about 6:30, 7 o'clock in the morning. The guy was going on his way to a hospital. Somebody tipped him, and the car was out front afterwards. And not only did they shoot it up, they blew it up. And then the, you know, so the Baja uh, shopping center also, they blew that up when I was there in 2003. So, and the, these are at the end of when those cartel days were going. So, and it was still action going on. But like you said, guys from the neighborhood that don't know, 
we traveled the world, so we had a little different understanding of the violence in some of these countries. But uh, did he, let me ask you a question. Chris Pagello, he owns uh, some clubs in Miami, he owns some clubs in L.A. Uh, he had problems with the Persicos. He, he ended up cooperating. Did Teddy ever speak about him? Uh, yeah, mo uh, he spoke about him a little bit, but Eddie spoke about him. Eddie Garofolo spoke about him a lot, more more than Teddy, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, What did Eddie have to say? I mean, Eddie used to like him, and then, like, you, of course, used him, sponged off him when he had the clubs and everything else, and then he said, oh, he's just a rat, and, uh, you know, thinks he's the tough guy, and and uh, Teddy really didn't have much to say about him, because I don't think he really hung out with him as much, you know? Well, you're going to get guys that are always going to talk, listen, and we talk about this, Eddie's not one of those guys, ain't no tough guy, so, you know, he never put no work in any nonsense, so the guys that talk like that nonsense... You know, I, I want to hear more from a guy like, you know, Teddy, guys that have done things, put work, you know, comes from a family, it's dangerous. So, you know, it's a little different when it comes from, from a guy like Teddy. I was just curious well, if, right. what kind of resentment he has towards, you know, Chris, obviously. The other Columbos had resentment, like Craig Craig Marino, he had resentment towards Chris. Um, mm -hmm. Jump Danza didn't really like him. He's a Lucchese guy, but uh, they didn't really like him. But, yeah. you know, Chris I, 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 I took that with a grain of salt. Was he? What? Chris, Chris Pacella wasn't a punk from what I heard. I, I don't think he was. Uh, uh, Chris, a Chris, I know Chris for a lot of years. Chris is a big, big kid, strong. He can, you know, he can use his hands a little bit. But uh, he ain't wild with a gun like that. He wasn't like that. But, you know, he's he's not no dog. I mean, he's, he's, he's a big kid. So, but, you know, guys like Jimmy Calandra, guys like that, that used guns were, were dangerous in a different way. Right. So, yeah. You know, but well, my, uh, buddy, my buddy was locked up with him in Farrington and he said that uh, he was the strongest dude in the jail. He said he yeah, was listening strong. to the whole jail. Yeah. yeah. I mean, like like Chris and I have this, we have friends in L.A. that we share friends. You know what I mean? Like we have the same friends. I just like I, I've only I've been in the same place with them one time. I don't know him. So but yeah, I mean, like just from what I know, you know, does you know, doesn't talk shit, does his thing. So. Yeah. I mean, you got guys like Chris ran into Joey Molino for the guys that were asking me about Joey and Chris opened his mouth to Joey back and forth. And I think they were at a basketball game or something, maybe yeah. a hockey game. I don't remember. Yeah. But uh, one of the guys that was at the at the location when it happened called me and told me about it. And I told him, listen, you know, Chris is a big kid. He's tough with his hands. Joey's not a, a fighter with his hands. But don't get it fucked up. Uh, Chris is way out of his league with Joey. If Joey wasn't in the situation he was in, and he's always in. Uh, Joey's not a dummy, and Joey's a tough guy as far as street-wise. And uh, intelligent, and if it was any other location, uh, Chris wouldn't get away with that. And, you know, and I, I don't think Chris is stupid enough to believe he would. But, you know, so when guys are commenting about that over the years, I keep hearing the same thing. I go, listen, you can't take away from Joey what Joey is. Joey's uh, a street guy, smart guy. Uh, and he doesn't need anybody doing any shooting for him. He does it himself. So uh, Chris got lucky because of the situation and the location. Other than that, Chris is good with his, again, he's, he's a big guy, he's strong, but he's, yeah, not, uh, he's not a shooter. Yeah, one of the things that people don't understand, they won't understand about, about Merlino is that even if he touches Chris, he's, he's hitting, getting a federal witness. They're going to hit him with a federal charge for that. Oh, he's going to get life no matter what. Joey's at yeah. that level no matter yeah. what he does. Uh, but it's still, he's still a, he's still a federal yeah, witness. You know what I mean? So, disciplined. you know, Joey is disciplined. Joey's not, uh, you know, when I talk about gangsters, he wasn't on a big stage as far as New York, Chicago. I mean, he's in Philadelphia, but he's a very intelligent gangster. If, if he's nobody's dummy. Yeah. Nope. Kenji, uh, Kenji, when did they pull you out? Like, when did this case all, like, uh, ravel out? Like, what happened? What was the whole situation with that? Well, what happened is I got burned out. Like I was like, I was doing this for about eight years and that was like over it. Like, like I said, I, I liked a lot of the people. Like I liked Craig, I liked, I didn't like Craig Marino. I liked John Bedanza. I liked Teddy. I liked a lot of the guys, like a lot of people I met all around the country. I met guys in Cleveland that I like, I like Billy Delano. I met uh, guys in Rhode Island and I didn't want to keep doing that. I didn't want to do it. Like some dudes that are just scumbags and like killer, I don't really care about. But like I said, I, I said, Island, like yeah. Did you know what? Eddie? Eddie, the boss in Rhode Island? Did you know him or no? No, 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 no. He's a nice guy. He actually yeah. is a pretty nice guy. And, you know, people say, well, don't you know? 
Listen, I'm not a Jehovah Witness. I say it again. I'm not going to okay what they're doing for a living. Uh, I don't, you know, live that way anymore. But for guys that are in the life, you meet some gentleman that Eddie was one of them. He did time with me and uh, we used to hang out, walk a lot. And he was a gentleman, intelligent guy. So, uh, you know, that being said, when people say, well, I think this show is about kids, it is about kids. But we still got to be honest and fair when we're talking about guys from the street. You got to give them, you know, who they are and what they are. And he was one of those guys who was gentlemen also. Well, you, you, what I'm, yeah, what I was saying about these guys is there's a lot of guys in this life that are just in the life, man, that this is what they do, but it doesn't make, I mean, they do bad stuff, but they're not like a bad, bad human being. And there's guys that we, you and I both know that are like bad human beings. You know what I mean? There's a difference. And what's and like, I was talking to you the other day, it's crazy now is you see these people, some of these old guys that I used to hang out with like the voice of reason they love america i mean they could be they you know they fought in world war ii korea or vietnam and they love they love america they might be criminals but they would still have like like i i never yelled at a cop i never yelled at the fbi i never fought with them i just turned myself in and be done with it but uh to answer your question at 2000 and i in 2005 i was getting burned out i did not want to do this anymore i told the fbi like a couple times like i didn't want to do it i didn't want to do it to teddy i was over it but then teddy ended up pulling me in and wanted to do a hit one day and it, it, all this sh this stuff went down and then it just it, it, it i re i was recording it i can't turn the recorder off it's on it's on for 13 hours that's it there's two of them and i have no control over whether it goes off or not it just goes off when it runs out and he was picked up there getting the gun and, and telling me what to do and telling everything else and so I kept saying to him, like, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't, I'm burnt out. And they, they let me go back to California for a while. And then I had to keep coming back to Brooklyn. And so finally, I got into a, um, into an argument with Manny Garofolo. Uh, he's a you know, cons big construction guy. He, he called me into a meeting at, uh, at a diner right off of, um, right when you go to Coney Island. It's the, I think it's called the Coney Island Diners, right on the side of the road on the Bell Parkway. And... Uh, he met with me and he started telling me, asking me if I told Teddy that uh, that he was laundering money for me and all this other stuff and accusing me of stuff. And I felt like telling him because I really didn't tell him that he was laundering money for me. But I felt like telling him, like, hey, dumbass, I'll just play you back the tape. I recorded <laughs> it. I could, I could tell you exactly what I said. And then when, when we were at the table, Manny just started he started like yelling at me and we, they put me in a close. We were in a closed off section of the of the of the diner it was like it was making me nervous and he started yelling at me getting like all irate and then i told him then he told me he goes if you if you don't i was smirking because i was laughing and thinking in my head like i never said this shit it's a lie yeah. and they're trying to he's trying to he's trying to put and he's like he's like what are you smirking about he goes if you don't wipe that smirk off your face i'm gonna punch you in the face and i told him like if you punch me in the face i will knock out all your teeth and i will <laughs> i will fucking get on a plane I will knock you out and I will get on a plane and drive, go back to California. And there's not a fucking thing you guys can do about it. Right. Cause I, I'm from California and I'll go there and I'll do whatever the hell I want. And so yeah. I told him that he goes, you would raise your hands to me. And I go, dude, in two seconds. Right. So I, and I go, I'm meeting is over. I'm getting up and I got out. And so as I was trying to get out, he tried to grab my arm a couple of times to get me back to the diner. And I'm like, no. And then when I went, when I started to go down, I got out of the place. There's a abandoned gas station. I think it's like a sit go or something. It's like an empty gas station. And right behind it, I saw uh, a little Honda and I saw this guy, Frankie, and this guy, Walter, that they hang around Teddy and they're from the neighborhood, you know, like they're shooters. I saw them sitting in the car and then I knew exactly what. Because and then Manny's trying to get me to go to the he wants me to go to the to the truck yard over in Staten Island. And I'm like, no, no way. No way. Yeah, yeah. Right. I'm not getting a car. And so he, he pulls up next to me. He's like trying to pull me in. And I'm like, not not in a million years. And so now, I, I. Are these agents around when you're meeting them? Are the agents close by? No, dude. They're nowhere. They're nowhere to be. Dude, come on. They're, this is like, this is a night. They're, they're, they're it's closed. No one knows where I'm at. So he's trying to pull me into the car. And I'm like, I just got to get, I, I, hit, I hit the start on my truck. Electric start. And I'm like, underneath the seat, I got a gun, man. I'm like, dude. Those two idiots are not getting me. So I got right. the, I got between my truck and the, and them. So I had the truck in between me and them. And I re, and as soon as I started the car, I hit the door open. I reached underneath and then I got in. And then 
their their little car is not stopping my truck. So I got in the car and I I went to Belt Parkway and I got on. I went to Manhattan because I was living in Union Square at that point, not in Bay Ridge anymore. And uh, I started driving and then all of a sudden Eddie, everyone started calling me and they're trying to get me to come back. And I'm like, no way, not a chance. And then they're like, then they said they kept they kept wanting to meet me and I'm like, you could meet me in Manhattan. Right. Meet by Square. We'll meet right there. You know, but, I'll pick the place. But I got to tell you, Teddy must have really trusted you to talk to you about doing a, a murder, to do a piece of work. I mean, he really had to trust you to have those Dude. conversations about getting guns and you just got to kill somebody. I mean, Dude. that's not a conversation you just have with anybody. I was in his mom's house when he did that. Wow. Yeah, yeah. we went to, we, we went, we were all, we were eating at 101 and we just finished eating and he's like, hey, I'll take you home. And then I got in the, it was Eddie driving his truck and I was in the back as a king, as a king, king cab. And so we got to my house, it's on Shore Road, uh, 6833 Shore Road. And I get out of the car and I started walking towards the front of the building. And then Teddy rolls his window down and yells at me and goes, get in the back, get back in. And so we got back in the car, in the truck. And he goes, he goes, we're going for a ride. We got to, we got to go to my mom's house, my mother's house. I got to get, we got to get some gear. And he goes, we're going to deal, we're going to deal with Finelli and we're going to deal with, with Marino right now. And then he said that he, and then he, he starts calling and he calls his brother and he's like, get my gear, get the gear, meet me in mom's house. And so we're, we were driving there. I was just, you know, just sitting there like listening to it. And I'm going, oh man, I'm in trouble because the FBI is stressed. The one thing I can't do is, you know, be involved in any violence whatsoever. So like, I'm really stressed out. And he's like, you know, Craig's a Craig's a he Craig Craig's a good guy, like meaning that he's a made guy and that but he's just with that other group and those dudes try to kill my dad. Like he starts telling me this kind of stuff. And then he's like, You you don't got a problem with this, right? And I'm like, No, because you know, <laughs> I'll be the next one. <laughs> and so we we go to his mom's house and I'm sitting in the, like he goes, come, come on, come on inside, come and talk to my mom. So I'm sitting at the table and his mom is like showing me these pictures of like the first mother's day teddy's been there in like 17 years and she's like giving me water she's asking me if i want food it's like kind of like goodfellas man she's like asking me if i want food and teddy's like ma he doesn't want anything and then eddie garofolo was like i gotta take a crap and so he ran off maybe i think he might have just he might have made a phone call to somebody to be honest but um now they look back on it so then teddy's like you know, talking is me, him and his mom. And then he takes me in like this back part of the house and he starts telling me like, you know, we're going to deal with this shit. Today's the day. We're going to deal with this shit. And then all of a sudden his little brother got there with a box and he's with this kid, Walter, and they got this box and it has some guns in it, but it was a pretty sad little box. Let me tell you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It was, it was pretty, pretty pathetic looking like rusty, <laughs> You know, not not good. So Teddy takes out a Walter PPK and and then his brother starts telling him, like, it's not clean. You know, you got to you got to you got to clean up. All the Teddy's like, what the fuck are you bringing me shit that's not clean for? And he's like, I know how a gun works. And then and then the brother's like, I don't have any me and me and Walter don't have any uh, don't have any uh, gloves. And Teddy goes, well, take your fucking socks off. then. What kind of gangsters are you? And then he gives me the box and he goes, you get get one of the guns. And I'm like, so I started looking through. And there's like two guns, but there's no bullets for him. Oh my God. And he's like, so he's like, bro, can't you just make one work? Can't you just put one in? And I go, dude, a 38 won't fit in, I mean, a 357 won't fit in a 38, dude. You know, the opposite would work, but not that. And yeah. so I'm trying to explain to him, and he's like, well, just carry it. And I'm like, dude, I don't want to carry an empty gun. And he's <laughs> like, he goes, you, you got your knife? And I go, yeah. And he goes, okay, well, you're going to watch by the restaurant. And if anyone comes that way, you're going to deal with it. I'm taking the kid down by the water. And then he told his brother and the Walter, or yeah, Walter, he told them, he said, uh, you guys stand across the street. This is going to go down at 101. Because Craig knew better. He didn't want to come to their mom's house. Right, he right. Didn't, he, did not, he did not want to come in that neighborhood. He knew better. He pretty much, he goes, he said, no, my car's already Valley Park. So then we, we started driving over there. And, and I wasn't saying anything because... I'm trying to figure out, like, how could I contact the FBI and tell them that, you know, some bad shit's about to happen. And I'm involved. I'm, not only I'm involved, I'm in the car. And uh, I'm trying to think about it. I'm trying to get the whole thing on tape because he's freaking out, like, saying what crews with this and everything. And I'm like, 
Okay, and so as we come over this little rise and we're coming right over on Fourth Avenue, we're coming up to where to where 101 was and everything. Dude, there's like a a huge like fire engine, hook and ladder, and a paramedic and an NYPD car in front with their lights on. And, and Teddy starts screaming. He goes, "We haven't even done anything. They're already here." And I'm thinking in my head, "Wow, the FBI is really they're listening to me. Like they already know what's going down." And then then I look and I see him there wheeling out a guy from a restaurant next door and he's got like, I, he must have had a heart attack because they're like, he's got like thing on him. They got all these things connected to him. And then, so they put him in the ambulance and he goes away and then the cops are still standing there. So then Teddy goes to me, is tell my brother and Walter that it's off, but I'm taking the kid down by the water anyway. So if anything goes down, just watch my back. And I go, okay. So I'm sitting out there and Teddy grabs Craig and they're, they're going to talk. And then I look across the street and I see, I see the, the uh, his brother and I see that Walter kid with the sock on their hand across <laughs> the street and I'm like and I start waving at him saying hey man this shit is this is this is done man we're not doing this and he's like I you know Teddy's got to tell me I don't know anything about it so then I finally I saw Danny and then I go Teddy man go tell your brother to, that they gotta go man and you know so then Danny ran over there and told the brother um, that we gotta end it and then then Teddy comes back. And then Craig Marino looks like, like Craig Marino is the guy who I used to hang out with and I used to go to movies with and like, you know, we go out to eat and like, hang out, go to the city. And now he's looking at me like he wants to kill me. And Craig is like a, for real, he's a shooter. He's a guy yeah. that will, he's a kid. Yeah. 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 He will really, really kill you. But you so know, he's amazing. They didn't have some legitimate guys. I mean, he's just grabbing guys out of desperation. I'm shocked that he doesn't have some legitimate shooters with him. And even the equipment is like, you know, like almost childish. It was, it was like, dude, I'd never seen anything like this, like the equipment. And I don't know why he didn't go get legit. Like, I think maybe because he'd been gone so long, he just didn't have the legitimate people. Walter is a legitimate guy. Walter was a legitimate guy. He's the guy that, that got stabbed by the Gambino guys and everything. He's a legitimate dude. I don't know who he is. How yeah. old is he? He's he's from he I think he's I think he got deported I think he went back to Italy or maybe he went back on his own, okay. but uh, I I mean at that point he was probably like under thirty or just at thirty. Maybe he so, went back on his own after he got stabbed up by uh, by my yeah. old crew. Yeah, yeah, he did get stabbed by your old crew. Stabbed, like, I, I didn't stabbed, care the guy who did it, but you know him who did yeah. it. So anyway, this whole thing went down, and then Teddy comes up to me, and, T and Craig Marino looks like he's got about to just to kill me he wants to kill me i can tell and teddy goes hey man i squared it with craig but just don't turn your back on him i'm like what you know like now i gotta deal with this on top of that you know what i mean and so i was like i was like really burned out and then teddy teddy uh like he took me like afterwards he started talking to me and uh like we hung out a little bit longer that night that time like after that was over and we were hanging out and he walking around he wants to know like how people were making money on his name and like i was working at this 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 uh i was working with these guys that own a telecom business in in downtown that that everybody's making like 80 to two hundred thousand dollars a month and they had leased teddy a car like this new mercedes and we bought him a truck like i pitched in the money we bought him like a fifty thousand dollar truck when he got out but he's like Man, you know, like uh, all these people are making money. I go, bro, you're not making any money. They're, you, they leased you the car. You don't own this car. It's like rental. And he didn't understand. I'm like, dude, it's like a rental. It's yeah. not yours. It's like they're paying a thousand or twelve hundred dollars a month, whatever they're paying. You know, it, it's the like gears. And then I'm like, he's like, yeah, but look at this place I live in. I go, bro, you're renting it. Everyone yeah. else owns multiple houses. Eddie, Manny, they own the tow yard. They're getting like. Yeah, well, I own the I, I own the trucking company. I'm like, but it's not in your name. Those guys are getting the equity. Like, I own the parking lots. I get I'm getting money from them. I'm like, no, they're giving you two thousand dollars a week, but they're making the big money from the equity. And when they sell it, you're not going to get anything. And so he wasn't getting all that. You know what I mean? Like, I was over it, and I just didn't want to lie to him anymore. So I was like telling him, like, you know, and that's yeah. why Manny that's why Manny later on and came back to me and said that I told Teddy that he was laundering money for me. Right, right. Manny Garofalo was, which. What, you know, which I never told Teddy that I just told him right. the truth about the money. And then after that, so, you know, after that whole thing with, with, with Manny at the diner, then I got, I was like, I'm not going back, but I met, I met with Teddy and them after that. Yeah. But, but I'm shocked. Well, I got to tell you the truth. I mean, right, Gene, I mean, 
I'm shocked that they have such a trust level for a guy that didn't grow up with them. That they don't really know too much about you, except that you were from L.A. around some people. Yeah. To, to, to involve you in, this, in, in, the, in the personal talks, attempted murders, murders, is it's incredible to me. Wait, and, but, uh, and, well, and even to have these weapons like this in socks. And I mean, you know, we, we put something together. We put it together, you know, we're supposed to be the mob, the guys that know what they're doing. And they put it together the right way with well, guys, mobs, equipment, radios. Who vowed for you? Like, who co-signed for you to be next to the acting boss? Like, who put you next to this guy? Like, his brothers and, and everyone else. You know, like, like they, you, you understand, like, this. I'm a real, I'm a quiet dude. I don't really do anything. I make, I made a lot of money. Like, I made money. I pumped in stop, money. Stop, you right there. You just yeah. said you made a yeah. lot of money. That's how you know. Yeah, the money always walks everybody through the door because guys, they got green eyes. They're greedy. Instead of looking to see what's up, instead, they're all trying to grab at you because they know you're making money. So you just said the magic words. You're, you're making money. And that's when everything goes out the door. Any kind of uh, sensible thinking on a street guy's mind goes out the door because they wanna, they're worried about uh, how they're going to bring in money. So that opens the door. So people out there that are, are listening... Got it because to me it's incredible what you got on tape and how long you're working for enough for the FBI and yet these guys don't really know you and allow you in their inner circle like this and even bringing you on even though it was the way I mean Mickey Mouse the way they set up the killing or trying to kill somebody is is almost I mean really uh, laughable I don't even know what word to use but uh, you know the, the capability of setting up I mean. It's, kind of really bush league, but I mean, for them to even involve you, though, it doesn't matter how they set it up or how dumb they are or whatever, but to actually bring you on something and the whole thing being wired and taped is, is really incredible story. 